Welcome back to part two of this July 2020 edition of Questions and Answers on youtube.com slash casualtf2. I'm casual, and you provided the questions. If you haven't seen it already, this is the second of two companion Q&A videos. Go grab a snack, optimize your viewing environment, and get cozy. In fact, grab your scuba tank, because we're going deep. James Cameron Abyss level deep. Will Ferrell cheesiness level deep. But I'll rescue you. I'll rescue you if you drown. Hello, casual. I'm curious on your opinion on the absurdist philosophy. With regards to Team Fortress 2 especially, I find myself often feeling like Sisyphus, stuck, perpetually rolling a boulder up a hill as I attempt to rationalize the why of existence. In many ways, I feel this way while playing Team Fortress 2. It's a reflection of the chaos and uncertainty of life. A perpetual struggle to attempt to find a, a meaning or to simply embrace the chaos. So, casual, do you find purpose through Team Fortress 2? Or do you simply embrace the chaos of the game? Absurdist philosophy deals with the contradiction between the purposeful, sensical mind and the purposeless, senseless universe it seems to be in. And simply, I sympathize with the disconnect between the two, but I think the obsession with purpose and meaning is the problematic source worth moving past. I would tie this into a larger outlook I have that we could call post-conceptualism. Purpose and meaning are concepts, and I would argue not as important as they seem. When I hear a song and I'm suddenly inclined to dance to it, and then I do dance to it, is it because I find meaning in the song, or that there is purpose in dancing to the song? I would say it can be, but by no means has to be because of that. It typically just happens. In the same way that I return to consciousness in the morning, there's no purpose behind it or meaning, it just happens. And it is a fantastic thing. Just like hearing music and suddenly dancing is fantastic. So if those things don't need purpose or meaning to happen, why should anything else? When talking about this subject, it gets into a tricky territory where it can easily be misconstrued that I'm saying waking up in the morning is purposeless. It affirmatively is purposeless. And that's not what I'm saying. That's nihilism, and that's the trap. Meaningless, in a nihilistic sense, is still a type of meaning. Both meaninglessness and meaningfulness are concepts we use to describe our experience of reality, but not a part of reality itself. How do I know? Because meaninglessness and meaningfulness are only experienced as concepts intellectually. You may feel emotions when you experience reality, but purpose is a human attribution, a human explanation for the phenomenon. And I think that's what absurdism gets right at least underhandedly, that it is the mind that ascribes meaning and meaninglessness to reality, and that those ideas are not inherent to the reality. But you're not limited to your mind or your intellect that allows this debate of meaning and purpose to exist. No intellect is required to wake up in the morning or suddenly be compelled to dance to music. So intellectually, I may be able to find purpose in Team Fortress 2, and I could write you a whole long romantic essay about that and all of the lovely meaning I could find in it, but purpose and meaning doesn't have to do with Team Fortress 2 intrinsically when you play it. If anything, when you play TF2, you can escape the meaningfulness slash meaninglessness duality by just being immersed in experience and escaping the trifling questions of the intellect. I would argue that the pain of being Sisyphus, of being set with the task of permanently pushing a rock up a hill, is more so the self-awareness around the situation, of being aware that you are Sisyphus in this circumstance, than it is the actual experience of pushing the rock up the hill. 
I think it's very fair of you to make this parallel because we are similar to Sisyphus just by existing and that when we simply experience reality, that's all there is. It's when we intellectually look at ourselves and our situation in life and weigh the meaning or purpose in what we are doing that you become victim to your own intellect as you must bear the contradiction between your obsession with an intrinsic purpose and the apparent lack of intrinsic purpose in reality. Now, why do we obsess with purpose and meaning? Have I done that before? Of course. I've been like you, feeling like Sisyphus for so much of my life, searching for meaning in the blunt repetition. I think purpose and meaning are just good survival mechanisms, and that's why they've come to be. If you spend a week looking for food in a certain area and don't find any, we would decipher that experience as being purposeless because your actions didn't amount to anything. But of course, this is strictly in the paradigm of survival. It was purposelessness because your week spent searching didn't get you anything useful for survival. Was it meaningful or purposeful in other ways? Probably, yes. But again, these are just intellectual justifications for the experience, when the experience itself needs no justification to begin with. So, it's for good reason that we should worry about meaning and purpose, because it kept us alive as a species. Isn't it funny that this premise of purpose and meaning only exists under the pretense of survival? What is all that purpose and meaning about? It's about survival. What's survival about? Life? All this purpose hubbub is about life? That's funny. But we've done quite well for ourselves as a species. It's good instincts for you to worry about finding purpose in Team Fortress 2 and assessing its value in terms of meaning. But that's good survival strategies misdirected in a life where most of your survival needs are already met. There is a different kind of economic survival we must endure now that is distinctly new compared to the majority of our history as a species. But unless you're starving in the streets, your basic survival needs are met. So for the sake of reducing suffering, I'd say let go of that obsession with meaning and remember that life, existence, experience, whatever you want to call it, in all of its essence, both bad and good, requires none of this meaning to be what it is. Hey, Casual. My question has to do with learning another language. Um, I'm going to ask this assuming that you have experience learning another language. Uh, so I wanted to know what you think is the best method or I guess the quickest method for learning a new language. Um, the most popular way is in a classroom setting with a teacher. Uh, textbook and studying mostly grammar. Uh, it's what I did, learning Japanese for a couple years. Uh, I did the whole thing, studying a couple hours every day, listening well in the classroom, do the homework. Um, but looking back, I realized that doing that isn't what brought me to my current level. Um, what did was uh, consuming native material, um, listening, reading, watching Japanese things. Uh, so I wanted to know what you think about grammar in general, if you think it's necessary or if it's just a supplement of learning. Um, also similarly, I wanted to ask about learning an instrument for the first time and if you think the music theory can help learning uh, in the beginning. Personally, I learned playing guitar by watching people play and copying them. Um, doing that for six years, uh, I got decently far, but I want to know if you think that studying music theory has any role in uh, supporting the learning process of learning instrument, or if you think that it's just a personal preference thing. Uh, thanks. I'm similar to you in that I've taken years of Japanese and Chinese classes throughout schooling, and a lot of self-study of Japanese on the side. When I learned in a classroom setting, there is a sort of obsessive focus on grammar and understanding how the mechanics of a language work from a linguistic perspective. While I know some people complain that they spend so much time on that while simultaneously not teaching a lot of how normal people casually speak the language, 
I find that all of the rigorous grammar rules that I was forced to learn have been continually helpful when I try to understand Japanese. The bottom line, though, is it's not necessarily imperative to learning a language. Children don't understand the grammar rules in their native language until they're taught it in school, long after they've already intuitively understood it. Put simply, the quickest method for learning a language is to spend a lot of time studying. It could be by yourself, or it could be in a classroom setting. You could be learning it with exposure to people who speak the language, or you could have no exposure to native speakers. The most important thing in all these cases is how much time and attention you commit to it. If you really want to learn a language, spend an hour a day studying it. You'll learn it, pretty much guaranteed. You just can't quit. Doing anything for one hour every day without quitting is such a huge deal. You don't even have to pursue things with the crazy obsessive level of studying like four to six hours a day of the polyglot geniuses to get sufficiently good. The same goes for practicing an instrument. Most people just don't have one hour every day of focused practice in them. And it's not that they're not capable of it, they just probably don't want it that bad or care enough to do it. Moving on to the second part of this question, I have a lot more experience learning and practicing an instrument than I do with language, though a lot of the same principles seem to apply. Does music theory help learning an instrument? I think that has entirely to do with what your goal is on the instrument. I come from a predominantly metal background, and most of the musicians I've played with don't think about theory at all when they play or write music. Now, of course, there are some who do. I've met guitarists who felt like music theory was crucial for their development, and who expressed always struggling with just coming up with things like other people manage to do without theory. But people like that are the minority. So, again, in my world, which is generally rock and metal subgenres, I wouldn't suggest music theory to anyone unless they want to learn it. If your concern is playing music, then it's all about grinding mechanics and technique. If your concern is writing music, then it's all about grinding writing and getting good at tapping into the flow of creativity. Coming up with ideas is a muscle, and if it's difficult, you probably just haven't done it enough. Now, if you want to be a jazz musician and a great improviser, I think you'll find the opposite that it is the minority of great jazz musicians that didn't learn theory. But I can pretty confidently say, so long as your interest is not jazz or any kind of strictly improvisational music, you don't need theory. Music as a performative tool, like playing songs from start to finish, requires no theory whatsoever. And music as a creative tool is about expressing emotion. If you try to reverse engineer emotion and use this interval because on paper it has this kind of cadence, or use this kind of scale because it has this kind of feel on paper, or this kind of chord progression because of how it resolves or doesn't resolve in theory, you're kind of missing the point, in my opinion. I am a huge proponent of learning to listen to your instinct and follow what sounds good to you, not what seems good to you intellectually. Conclusively, if you want to learn theory, learn theory. If you want to be a jazz virtuoso, you probably need it. Otherwise, I wouldn't worry about it. You'll pick up a lot of those concepts unconsciously just by experiencing them in real music. Uh, so my question is, uh, what games do you play aside from TF2? And What's your experience with competitive TF2? All right, see. I actually don't play a lot of games aside from TF2, and never have. With the light exception of Minecraft, TF2 was the first game I ever dove deep into. However, lately I've been tremendously enjoying a Harry Potter RPG mod for Minecraft that is sincerely one of the most incredible projects I've ever seen, and has such a comprehensive attention to detail that it easily rivals any standalone game. Sometimes when I want to mess with or have deep conversations with strangers, I play VRChat. 
but progressively struggled with the hypersexualized anime aesthetic and hedonistic culture that pervades much of the player base. It's a very hit or miss game. Sometimes you have great unexpected interactions and conversations. Other times you wander around witnessing depravity and feel like there's an invisible wall between you and the world. I dabbled in Apex Legends last year and GTA 5 this year. But generally, it's very difficult for me to get interested in a game. I'd like to think I'll try anything for a few hours, but I'm not really someone who loves video games, like I love music. I just so happen to love TF2, so now I'm in the industry. I played TF2 competitively from about the summer of 2013 to the summer of 2015, playing Highlander in silver and gold. I was also on a South American Fours team and ended up playing a lot of lobbies in 2015. I actually really enjoyed competitive TF2, and I think growing side by side on a team is one of the most fun experiences you can have. But I think the details of getting six or even nine people to show up for scrims at the same time, let alone for an entire season, is incredibly difficult and taxing in lower divisions. If I could guarantee everyone showed up to scrims and matches and they happened on time, I probably might have played competitively in the last few years. Uh, yo, so I just, I just found this out um, and I thought it, uh, it would be a pretty good question actually, so I'm going to send you this one as well. Um, so Australia has banned anime um, to some degree, and uh, <laughs> Iowa has also banned the novel Forty Eight Laws of Power, which uh, that's a bit more of an interesting case. Maybe uh, look into what that novel's about because it's really great, and uh, there's actually like a bit of a more based reason for them to ban it. Alright, I'm gonna cut the recording. Looking o'er the valley where dreams came to die The mountains may be burning but the birds won't let the smoke affect their patterns of flight Dancing with burning sunlight So, I looked into this briefly, and it seems there was a call to ban anime or manga with sexual depictions of minors in the Australian Senate. I'm not sure if it went through or just died off. Typically, I have a very strict anti-censorship perspective, but I do see the value in censoring sexually indecent material or things like CP. A, to protect the youth who may be affected for the rest of their lives by extreme X-rated material that they find at a young age, and B, to fight against the exploitation of children that is required to make CP. This is an interesting case because I understand the moral argument to ban anime or any media that sexualizes minors. But there is something to be said for the fact that it doesn't require the exploitation and traumatization of actual children to exist. Pedophiles are a reality of society and will continue to exist foreseeably in the future as we have so much work to be done in ending cycles of abuse, let alone purifying our society's pleasure at any cost philosophies. So wouldn't you rather that they be entertaining themselves with cartoons than the real thing, if possible? I couldn't find anything specifically about the 48 laws of power being banned in Iowa, but I assume you're referring to as ban in many prisons, and possibly some prisons in Iowa being included. The 48 laws of power was a book I first heard about in my senior year of high school, when I was being inundated with a variety of material from red pill communities that I had discovered for the first time whether they be political, social, or sexual in persuasion. The author Robert Greene draws from historic examples and considers the human psychology that allows for people to accumulate power and get what they want. Interestingly, a lot of hardcore hip-hop culture seems to be pretty aware of this book, and it's also infamous from prison accounts as being something the archetypal skinny glasses-wearing psychopathic genius reads in prison, scheming their return and rise to power. So do I think prisoners should have the right to read the 48 Laws of Power? I mean, I guess, sure. And is it useful for a prison to ban it? I 
guess. I mean, at the least, it sends a message of suppression. Even if suppressing just one book that inspires Machiavellian manipulation is ultimately futile in denying the prisoners information about that kind of stuff. Hi, Casual. This is Ran. You need to come up with an idea of how humankind can go extinct through starvation. Okay? You need to imagine some sort of event or a chain of events that leads to food disappearing for people, which leads to extinction, right? How would you kill man through the food cycle without magic? Like, should be something fairly realistic. The sake of originality, don't use global warming the way it's commonly understood. I have to say, I find it difficult to come up with a good premise for this. Because there are so many ways in which humans could adapt, even to a dramatic catastrophe. At first, I was thinking about methods that involve disturbing the soil quality worldwide so that both crops would be unable to grow and animal ecosystems would be destroyed. The food pyramid of natural life is also easy to destroy if you simply eliminate a single tier of the hierarchy. But I think even in those previously mentioned situations where soil degradation has made farming impossible, or the food chain of natural life has been dramatically disturbed, causing mass extinctions of most species, humans would have ways to adapt using synthetic soils or factory systems designed to harvest certain animals in a closed environment. In either case, it could dramatically decrease the population, but I don't think it would cause extinction for humans. I guess it's a little unclear in the question how much money, power, or influence I would hypothetically have to execute this extinction. With sufficient resources, one easy method would be to control the research and narrative around nutrition to trick the population into eating toxic foods that would slowly kill them and discourage them or outlaw them, if possible, from eating the foods that would actually nourish them. I think the human race is too capable of adapting to create new food sources. Even in the case of environmental disasters that render most of or all of the earth useless for traditional agricultural and farming practices. So, because it seems difficult to cause extinction by sabotaging food production methods, I would see the only option as using misinformation to trick the population into eating food that will slowly kill them or make them sterile. Even then, you have the issue that if any small percentage of the population goes against the scientific consensus and nutritional experts, they will live on. Hello. Uh... Ga uh, casual. Um, my name is Chris. You know me already. But uh, I have a question for you. I've been debating this ever since I saw the announcement video. And all I have to ask is, um, when is the camping trip? Hi, Chris. The camping trip will happen when travel restrictions are lifted. I was hoping for this summer or fall because I'd prefer to avoid cold winter camping, but we are at the mercy of the general public health attitude. Hello, Casual. I've noticed that in the last few years, much of political discussions online uh, seem to have devolved to the most surface level discussion of social justice and also to labeling others like he's just as stupid as SJW, she's just a racist conservative, etc. I wish to know your opinion about that. Do you see this the same way? Why or why not? And if yes, do you think in the long term this would have a negative effect in society because the important real issues are ignored by the majority? Yes, I do see that politics discussion has become hyper-focused on hot-button topics, social justice included, and labeling people. And I do think this is ignoring the real issues. It's very obvious that if you're in what is generally considered a democratic country, your vote matters most for your local politicians, and least for your presidents and prime ministers. But people's general interest is actually scaled in the opposite direction, caring the least about their local institutions, leaders, and policies, and caring the most about the national level leaders, decisions, and global politics. 
Maybe that local judge you elect may have a say in a friend of a friend's court hearing, or a friend or family member's court hearing, or your court hearing if you get in trouble. The governor you elect could implement real changes to your immediate environment, stimulate your local economy and infrastructure, etc. Which country your leaders place sanctions on or go to war with, I would argue affects your day-to-day -day life very little. Unless, of course, you're at risk of being drafted into that war. With that all stated, I think most of the issues that really matter are out of our control. From my perspective, our democratic system gives the illusion of control, as we have little power over which issues and politicians actually end up on the ballot. Even if you reject wilder conspiracies, there is an indisputable shadow government pulling the strings from behind the scenes of wealthy donors and lobbyists fighting for corporate interests from a number of crucial industries, such as banking, medicine, energy, and the military-industrial complex. The power you have in most of your institutions is based on your financial contribution. And unless you are personally bribing politicians for $500,000 speaking engagements and funding lobbying yourself, I would say your vote is quite arbitrary, unfortunately. The only issues left to care about, then, that the vote seems to influence are the hot-button issues that separate the political left and right. Abortion, marijuana, guns, socialization of healthcare, etc. And interestingly, so many of the social justice issues that cause immense political partisanship don't even have a suggested policy attached to them. It quickly becomes more about values and whether you think something is fair and okay or not than the means to change it. You also asked if this phenomenon hurts society, and I think that's the biggest thing it does. Yes, I think it distracts from real issues, but I also think real issues are largely out of our control, even in a seemingly democratic society. The biggest effect of these increasing political tensions is inspiring animosity between a nation's own people, between neighbors. You could make an argument that this sort of social climate has been designed, encouraged, and pushed for by certain powers that be, but I don't have any proof or know for certain myself. But even if this move towards social justice issues and labeling people has been an organic trend, it has done an excellent job of directing the common people's rage at each other and away from the corrupt establishment that affects all of them. The tremendous irony of this steep political divide is how many people are oblivious to the fact that both sides strawman each other and accuse the other of lacking empathy when they simply have different value structures. And even so, they have different value structures that work complementarily together. When we see the party's values symbolically, the right for tradition and the left for the challenging of tradition, there is a place for both of these philosophies in a productive society. But if they don't respect each other and understand how they complement each other, if they refuse to work together or empathize with each other, no true progress can be made. Hey, casual. I hope you're doing well. Considering your comment on the Iraqi casualties in your TF2 screen assistant video, I'd like to know your opinion on the American government's international relations and policies regarding the Middle East within the last couple of years. In particular, its relationship between America and Turkey and Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Simply put, I think U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East has been a disaster, and a disaster for ordinary people. I would assume much of it has worked in favor of certain government's interests, certain government's oil interests, and certain government's geopolitical control interests. But for normal people, for ordinary people, what a disaster. It's been years since I kept up with this kind of foreign policy news, as I was more interested in the subject's history in the Bush Jr. and Obama eras. It's hard to even know where to begin when U.S. intervention in the Middle East has reeked of hypocrisy for so long. U.S. foreign policy since the Second World War seems to be all about fighting wars or fighting the war of influence with the Soviets and Chinese in developing nations. 
On one hand, most of America's foreign policy choices make sense. When you think of them like an empire, warring with other empires for their own self-interest. But I think as an American especially, this is difficult to swallow because of the dishonest premises and justifications for this foreign tampering that is sold to us by politicians constantly. Unfortunately, I can't give you any specific insights on recent affairs with SA, Turkey, and UAE, but I can't imagine it's anything new. Even if you forget all of the US foreign policy moves that are built on oblivious lies or simply don't add up, why has American military presence been in Afghanistan for essentially 20 years and still not achieve stability? Why is Afghanistan the booming capital of heroin production? From the outside, it doesn't seem like it makes sense or is working for us. Like, why would America assassinate Gaddafi, destabilizing Libya just in time to create space for ISIS to fill in? ISIS, the enemy of the United States. Why does the U.S. repeatedly arm and train soldiers and terrorist groups in these countries that often go on to become our own enemies? It only seems like these are bad choices and they don't make sense because we can't see the full picture. I think someone's profiting off of that mess. If it wasn't working for anyone, it wouldn't still be happening. Hey Casual, I just wanted to ask, um, how'd you get your music taste and like, how'd you get into the artists that you're into right now? When I was eight years old, my dad and I sat in his car after going to the rec center at night and he played the first few tracks of Van Halen's album 1984. This is the first memory I have of having a profound experience with music. And from there, I moved on to other 80s and 90s rock and metal taking a particular interest in bands like Metallica. And then soon I would discover the modern, new metal and metalcore bands like Disturbed, Killswitch Engage, Ben Sevenfold, Bullet For My Valentine. And that was essentially all I knew from age eight to 10. Around that time, I started poking around the internet on my mom's computer. I started discovering new bands thanks to this computer, like Symphony X, Exodus, and Dream Theater. But most uniquely, I developed this interest in finding metal from as many different countries as I could find. It was sort of like a quest in a way that I had decided for myself. It occurred to me that there might be metal from countries that don't speak English. And I thought that was really cool and wanted to find it. Either due to being a novice at the computer or it just being an earlier era of the internet, it was difficult to find very much. I remember discovering F in France, the eclectic and obscure folk metal band Grodin from Russia, across a Kauda, a Metallica clone from Iraq, and then on Mioza from Japan. On Mioza was really the gateway to the discovery of a lot of Japanese music, mainly through a subgenre or perhaps subculture, depending on how you look at it, known as Visual K, which is defined by its eccentric sense of fashion, hair, and makeup but musically ranges anywhere from pop rock to neoclassical power metal to deathcore. And this was the start of my second main period of music listening from age 10 to 12, where I still listened to the mainstream Western metal I had become familiar with from before, but was increasingly focused on Japanese rock and metal bands. Throughout these years, I had been introduced to some electronic music in small spurts but it was only an occasional song I would discover on accident that would stick with me. Around age 12 and 13, I became increasingly interested in electronic music. My discovery of artists like Sander Van Dorn, First State, and Tiesto, who I all think made cool records in the 2000s and made lame records in the 2010s. In conjunction with my school friends introducing me to the occasional hardstyle anthem they discovered, propelled me into this new period where I began to flourish in discovering new music thanks to the internet climate of electronic music in 2011. Firstly, I found a load of stuff on YouTube. There was a channel called Going Quantum that would upload mixes, 
mainly of dubstep, but also a variety of other genres and subgenres that were new to me. There were a number of these YouTube promotion channels that I started to follow and discover all kinds of new electronic music. Second, there was a site called Turntable FM, where you could join rooms where users would take turns playing songs. They would take turns DJing for each other, essentially. And I specifically remember hanging out in the trance and drum and bass rooms and finding new songs I loved every time I logged on. There was also a dubstep artist named Stephen Walking, who would live stream 24 hour long DJ sets on Ustream. It was my first memories of ever watching a live stream, and it worked the same way all of these other outlets did. I showed up, but someone else who knew more about it than me was curating the music and helping me discover things I would have never found otherwise. That summer, Stephen Walking, along with other artists I knew at the time, Nelio, Feng, Afixa, and the aforementioned mixmaker Going Quantum, were set to be joining forces for a mysterious project where they were essentially making their own YouTube promotion channel slash record label called Monster Cat Media, which would introduce me to even more artists in the coming months. Initially, I identify a lot with the high energy of these electronic genres and consider it similar to how I liked the high energy from rock and metal bands. But I started to develop a soft side too, with genres like trance where I would just enjoy these beautiful melodic breakdowns for the first time in my life. Just as with the previous phases, I still listened to some mainstream western metal and visual K, but my priorities were quickly shifting in favor of electronic music. By the time I was 14 or 15 years old, I was completely obsessed with electronic. Drum and bass, trance, dubstep, hardstyle, but with a particular growing interest in more ambient inspired, gentle and melodic electronic music. Electronic music shifted my focus towards really being aware of the quality of the sound in a way I had never done before when I was only listening to rock and metal. I love that you could take a thousand different trance songs and they would all start with a similar kick drum and minimal percussion, no semblance of melody, but they all had a unique identity. If you paid attention, no kick drum was the same. I really started to appreciate the timbre of music, just as much as I had been appreciating the melody and rhythm of music before. And as I continued to exercise this appreciation for sound, I started regaining interest in conventional band music, and essentially anything I could get my hands on with an interesting timbral identity. It was around this time that I discovered Bandcamp, and began browsing on the site for anything I could download that was free, which had me listening to post-rock, acoustic, post-hardcore, math rock, jazz, ambient, hip-hop, and all kinds of experimental music that isn't quite done justice with a single genre tag. Suddenly, I was listening to everything. At first, it was the appreciation of the timbre, the way it was recorded and mixed that got me listening to band music again but I started to appreciate the music for what it was as well in those styles. And this is where my music listening trajectory becomes very hard to track because I really started expanding outward in every direction. I started out the journey as an electronic fan who used to be really into metal. And a couple years later, by the time I was 17, my music taste didn't really have a central focus but it was around age 17 or 18 that I started to get reeled back into band music further, thanks to a certain set of post-rock and math-inspired emo and screamo bands, namely Crash of Rhinos, The Little Explorer, Mineral, and Killy. I started listening to those bands every day. All the while, I started revisiting my old phases too, and returning to the Japanese bands and electronic music I knew before, some of which didn't hold up, but some of which still certainly did. And there's been all kinds of phases along the way since then. I got really into power metal a bit after those emo bands, then mathcore, and death metal for a while. I think my music taste has always continued to expand because since I was like nine, I've constantly been looking for new music. 
something I always enjoy doing, and there's nothing quite like the satisfaction of finding something new that blows your mind and makes you feel something you've never felt before. My taste has almost always expanded by looking into related artists, related projects, related scenes, or related influences of music I already know. And sometimes you just stumble into something randomly, or are introduced to something by a friend and that starts a new thread. And the more you explore, it's like a tree with exponentially increasing branches. Hi Casual, uh, it's your boy Stinky Penis. A uh, question I've been wanting to ask for a while now is whether you would rather live with no internet for the rest of your life or have it but not be able to leave your state ever again. Uh, thanks for the response. With this question, I think you have to consider both options and the best way to deal with each of them. So first, let's assume I decide to forego a life of internet in exchange for free travel. I can go anywhere I want, which is nice, but I've crippled so much of my opportunity in life. So much of the world functions online now, and to be completely without it is almost impossible. So, in an ironic way, I would have little connection to the real world and likely feel totally isolated from much of the culture my peers experience and consume if I couldn't be on the internet. That's to say if I even could maintain peers. Consider how this virus pandemic has played out, and how much worse it would have been if you couldn't have communicated with any of your friends or family through the internet. So many forms of work these days involve the internet, somehow. Even if the only part of the equation that happens online are the merchant services and invoicing of clients. Most job applications are now online as well. I know there would be a lot of advantages to this choice, in that I think a life without internet could give me a lot more time for certain hobbies and help me stay more connected to the quote-unquote real world, but we obviously know this would be a colossal challenge otherwise. So, what could I do to survive if I chose that? The most obvious solution is to have an assistant of some type who performs most of the required internet services for me. For instance, I could still make YouTube videos, I just would need someone else to upload them for me and manage the channel. And maybe that same person could keep me in the loop with certain online happenings I want them to keep tabs on for me. Or they could help me download new music when it comes out, or manage my banking and file online applications when necessary. This could be a doable arrangement, but it would require a strong alliance. Someone would essentially have to be willing to fulfill this role for me forever. It's always possible I could pay some random person, but due to the restriction of the internet, it would be most convenient if they were someone I lived with. It would be a lot easier than having to call an employee either numerous times throughout the day or having to save up all the things I need to ask my internet research and operations employee about for my end of the day, once a day phone meeting. Now, let's assume the opposite choice, and I live with internet, but I'm confined to my state. The main downside to being confined to my state, as I see it, is that there really is no loophole to leave my state. If there was some event happening that was outside of my state that I really needed to go to, there would be no way for me to be there. The logistical implications of changing the state boundaries to fit my needs would only work domestically. It would also require an exorbitant amount of power and still would be really difficult to pull off, let alone considering how untimely this solution would probably be. If I choose no internet, I could have someone else perform certain tasks on the internet for me, and it's still getting the job done. But if I wanted to visit, let's say, Greece, if I send someone over to Greece to do it for me, it doesn't work in that same way. The main immediate dilemmas I see in the option of keeping internet but not being allowed to leave the state are these two things. One, that I lose my ability to travel and see friends who live in other locations. Which okay, we can argue that they would just have to visit me instead, which is fairly doable, 
and there'd probably be an understanding of the situation like, I get it man, it was this or no internet. And I could even pay for people's travel expenses, as if I were paying for my own travel expenses to go see them. I think I could tolerate never seeing the beauties of other places, as long as I could still see the people that matter to me. The next problem that comes to mind is concerts. I really love live music, but I'm also living in a state that is terrible for live music, or at least for the kinds of music I care about. A major city in any adjacent state has 10 times the tour traffic that I do here, and it certainly would be suck to be locked here musically. I suppose the only solution to that is to become an event promoter and work to get that tour traffic to my state, which would be very difficult but possibly ultimately rewarding, and if successful, I will have brought that which mattered most to me to my backyard. I think there's enough population in my city and state for this to be viable, but it also makes me think about how no one's doing that right now already, probably because people see little opportunity for many styles of live music here as it is. So with all this said, weighing our two options, I will choose free travel in exchange for no internet. Sure, there's some things that will really suck about it. You can't play multiplayer games or watch live streams, or get lost in YouTube rabbit holes. But most of the essential things I need from the internet can be handled with the help of another person. And I think it would ultimately have a positive effect on my life to not be able to spend any time on the internet, at least in terms of productivity. So, what would you choose? Hey Casual, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on the censorship going on on YouTube. I'm not talking about individual people like Alex Jones or demonetization because they've been discussed to death. I mean the recommendation system that suppresses your video spread if you do anything remotely offensive, or how if you type a comment with swears in it, it's shadow banned until someone sorts the comments by new. What can I say, man? That sucks. It's harder for me to notice being blacklisted from recommended because I don't think my channel was particularly big or particularly controversial, but I've completely noticed the shadow banning of comments, even on other social media platforms, and I hate it. So often I see the text, 12 comments, but then only nine of them are visible. And ironically, it seems to be shadow banning real people more often than bots. It seems like we're seeing bots comment in videos constantly now. I really don't like this because it takes control away from the creator to foster the kind of environment and community they envision for their audience. There's already an option to allow all comments or block potentially dangerous comments or hold suspicious comments for review, but even if you set it to allow all comments, people's comments can still be hidden automatically unless you sort by newest first. I'm definitely going to be experimenting more with having my video's comments be sorted by newest first, rather than most relevant. I can't remember if this is just in my imagination, but I feel like that's how it worked on YouTube 10 years ago. And I think that system encouraged you to actually have a bit more of an adventure checking out the comments. Particularly on videos that get loads of views, you really get a very watered-down perspective of the audience because you only see the ideas that the most people agree with. All of the truly hot takes and more unconventional wisdom, or even just unconventional humor, will get lost and buried by those most popular comments. I'm definitely of the camp that has said YouTube is too big to fail, and sort of thought things will never get bad enough for a substantial population to actually jump ship, but I think there's something to be said for YouTube actually being big enough to fail. So many of the gripes with YouTube seem to be what its systems do automatically, because it's impossible for them to review things manually, or just trust their user base and confidently deflect any liability of shit that may happen on their platform. People's videos get demonetized just for having certain buzzwords or seeming like they may be problematic by the algorithm. Comments are shadow banned based on a host of suspicions, and I can't even really identify what they are, because I've seen completely harmless normal comments be filtered out and not deemed relevant. And the thing that absolutely frustrates me the most is music identification on YouTube. 
It's probably happened three or four times now where I had a video that I just uploaded and it had 30 or so different songs used for short periods of the video in the background and one of the songs gets identified and has the video blocked worldwide. Now look, I think it's a terrible music business strategy to worldwide block people's videos who use your music on YouTube when they could just as easily essentially kidnap that entire video and monetize it for themselves. But I respect that if Ivan Arset or fucking Zankyo Records wants to block any of their music being on YouTube, they should be allowed to. But why in a 40 minute video where I use their song for 90 seconds should the entire video be blocked? And in the same vein, why for 90 seconds of their music in a 40 minute video containing music from dozens of other artists should they automatically claim monetization for the entire video? In the case of the worldwide blocking, I see no reason why the cases of their music being detected shouldn't just be given to the copyright holder to handle on a case-by-case -case basis. Especially with the artists I have had run-ins with, I'm sure I'm like one of five people a year who try uploading a video with their music. If I'm just straight up uploading their track and the video is just five minutes of their album art, okay, take it down. But when they see that I'm using 90 seconds of their song in a 40 minute video essay as background to my monologue and I'm actually promoting their music and introducing new listeners to them, I'm sure the actual artist would be okay with approving that. I understand why these systems are in place. It's to protect the big guy who's worried about someone else blatantly uploading their music, getting hundreds of thousands of views when they either a. Want to be making royalties off of those blatant listens, or B. Are some weirdo conservative brand that doesn't want their music to be listenable at all on YouTube, even though you can stream it on Spotify without paying, probably. Or C. They have their own upload of the song and don't want another upload of the song taking views from their upload, which makes no fucking sense when you can already just claim monetization of someone else's upload of your song. I just think it's such a mess for people like me who want to use other people's music in an obviously artistic way, and often in a way of praise and promotion of the original music, and I have to worry about having my entire video blocked in certain countries or the entire world. It hurts me, and it hurts the artists. In the case of monetization, it's even messier. I'm still not eligible to make any money from these videos but many of my videos are monetized due to automatic claims from certain music that I used. And look, I'm all for the artist getting fairly paid, but consider that from the 90,000 views on how it feels to play Medic, the band Yaga Yazist has made 100% of the revenue, despite their music only being used in 16% of the video alongside nine other artists' music. Hi, Casual. My name is uh, Vush or Josh. And uh, my question was, uh, how do you take your life seriously? To you, anyway, you know? Like, how, how do you, uh, how do you, like, go about making your life better? Yeah. I think there is value in allowing yourself to look at things selfishly and use selfish motivations to lead you on the path back to caring about your life. For example, I might find motivation to make my life better with things like physical health, career, discipline, if I see the potential fun stuff that those things allow me, or how much better I might feel if I don't feel unhealthy, undisciplined, and hopeless. It's hard for me to know exactly the best thing to say that would be helpful for you without hearing more about your struggles. The problem might not be that you're not taking life seriously, but that you're taking life too seriously, and that's getting in your way. I'll draw up two hypothetical situations, so hopefully you can get something useful out of this no matter what. In the first case, let's say you are despondent towards life, and so you tend to avoid making decisions and taking action. You are in a state of paralysis, with no foreseeable change or progression in your life. You have trouble caring, and even though you may not enjoy where you are now, it's still comfortable to just stay there. It's possible you are having a hard time motivating yourself, because you don't necessarily believe that life can be better, or just that life can be good at all. 
because you haven't really experienced that before. All you seem to have is faith in what other people tell you, that life can be better. But it's hard to keep that faith when you don't see it honestly yourself. I don't know if I can say I was ever in this situation before personally, because even in my low periods when I didn't have any motivation to get better, I knew that pleasure and good feelings existed. Regardless, I would say if you're stuck in a place you don't want to be, but don't seem to care very much about doing anything about it, try finding something you do care about, anything. Maybe you care about certain small, trivial seeming pleasures, but don't disqualify yourself from the things that you could care about, even if they seem petty. Let yourself experience little joys and see them as a means to get you back on the path to caring. But there could also be deeper issues at hand, which is that hypothetically, you could care about things, but you never do. Why? I would say because you unconsciously don't let yourself care about things. Because if you cared about things, you could become attached to reality being a certain way, and you could be hurt when things go wrong. Part of the duality of pleasure and pain is that you must invest yourself into something to get either from it. If I start really caring about my health, for example, it sets me up to feel pain and shame and all kinds of terrible things when I'm not doing a good job taking care of my health. Which is why you might just choose to stop caring altogether. If I don't care, it won't hurt to be bad at it. But this opens up the other problem, which is that if you don't let yourself care, if you don't let yourself invest energy into your health, you prevent the outcome of being happy and satisfied when you do take care of your health. The ultimate medicine for someone who continues to refuse to care, who's protecting themselves from getting hurt, is acceptance. And it's also usually the medicine they least want to take. Accept the pain of life. Accept that you will grow attached to things and be hurt when they change or disappear. Life has pain, but that's not the problem. The problem is that you don't tolerate that pain. You don't accept life as it is, with all of its highs and all of its lows. You don't accept the unfairness of life. And why should you? Well, because you're preventing yourself from feeling anything. You throw out the lows, and you can't do that without throwing out the highs, too. Now, in the second case, let's say you are despondent towards life, but you act reckless and dangerous doing things that harm yourself and harm others. You have no hope for yourself, so you stopped caring about taking care of yourself. Maybe you chase pleasures dangerously and have lost any sense of self-control. You act on your impulses and are numb to the consequences of your actions. You take everything for granted. I've had to think about this second case for longer because it wasn't as easy for me to understand the motivations of likely because I've rarely gone in that direction when I felt despondent. But after thinking about it, my best guess is that it is simply the other side of the same coin. In both cases, despondency and numbness to the value and direction of your own life is a reaction to the trauma that comes with caring about life. For the second person, they avoid that pain and the unfairness of life by repeatedly exposing themselves to it. Instead of hiding away, they dive in and meet the suffering of life with an eagerness that grants them some immunity from that suffering. It's one thing to suffer in circumstances that are out of your control, and it's another to suffer by your own volition. By living dangerously and carelessly, you can regain a sense of that control. The chaos and hellishness is no longer chasing after you if you are chasing after it. I think people who go this way experience that pain of having their boundaries crossed by others or by the fate of life circumstances, and so they attempt to avoid that pain in the future by eliminating their boundaries entirely. How can you scare someone who welcomes danger? How can you hurt someone who welcomes pain? You can't, or at least this is why the strategy makes sense. 
but this approach still comes from a place of denial. A healthy, sound person doesn't need to feel invincible. They don't need to act purposely irresponsible in hopes that nothing will be able to hurt them anymore. A healthy person is at peace with their vulnerability. I think a daredevilish lifestyle is less about avoiding responsibilities and more about trying to compensate for your fucked upness by choosing to be fucked up. It switches the story from one of helplessness to one of intention, albeit intended disorder, which allows you to remain the author of your own life. Why? It would be too painful to feel that you aren't. And so what is the solution? Stop running from that sense of powerlessness. Accept that you can't control the outcomes of life. You can do your best, you can play your part, you can do everything right, and still get hurt. And that's okay. To stop acting reckless, as if your life doesn't matter at all, you have to deal with the need to feel invincible that draws you to that behavior. Thank you to everyone who submitted their questions. I know I said it before, but it's extremely cool to get so many of these audio questions sent in within a 24 hour period when I asked for it. Put simply, I'm impressed, and I look forward to doing more of these in the future. Lately, I've been polling my viewers more and more to get the best idea of what you want from my future videos. And I'm generally just trying to be more in touch with my audience to start building a community. If you use Twitter, please follow me on there. I follow back everyone who follows me as I like to interact with you, and it's also a good place to get updates on upcoming videos and let me know what kind of content you want. There's also a Discord server where we just hosted our first community event and had a fun day of experimental in-house pugs, which was a great experience to be able to chat with each other and just enjoy TF2. So every time I post a video, I put a Discord invitation link for the server that stays active for about 24 hours. The Discord server is slightly exclusive for a couple reasons. One, I'm gatekeeping it just slightly so that theoretically, the people who are there are people who really want to be there. People who want to participate in community events and who want to take part in discussions. And two, I'm trying to control the pace of entry so that we can actually acknowledge and interact with the people who join, but then also have enough time where no one new can get in so the people who are already there can just interact with each other and start to develop certain connections and familiarity. Think of it like the way school works. In elementary school, you may share a social environment with students across a variety of ages, and you get to know these students throughout the year. The participants in that system are fixed and consistent throughout this year which makes it easier to develop ties and associations. It is only when the next school year begins that they bring in a new wave of younger students. So I'm intending to sort of bring people in the server in a similar way, in waves. I think part of what makes social cohesion possible in a school-like environment is that you get used to the same set of people for a while. If every day at school new students were introduced into the classroom and some students randomly left, I think it would be harder for the students to settle in and actually start bonding. Finally, I just want to say I'm excited for the future of this channel. I'm feeling better about making videos than I have in a long time, maybe ever, and I have a ton of ideas I want to make. So with that in mind, I have a notice for you and a request for you. The notice is that in case you didn't know, as it seems a lot of people who were subscribed to me weren't even notified about it, I'm making a video essay series on the Japanese obstacle course competition television program Sasuke, aka Ninja Warrior. It's not TF2, but it's me. It's casual, and I swear it's sick as hell. There are two half an hour videos already out, and I'll be releasing the final installment soon. And last but not least, the request that if you are still here, you made it this long, 
please, please, please send this video to a friend. These videos take a lot of hours to make, and that's cool. I'm down with that. I'm out here grinding for you. But please, if you enjoyed it, help spread the word. Post it in your friend Discord. Start a discussion. And the reason I'm asking is that there is a certain milestone this channel is very close to reaching. Monetization. Yes, that's right. And I know we tend to have a quite cynical view about monetization these days, that you're basically collecting coins unless you have a huge, huge, huge following. And I know, and I don't care. It would be awesome to finally collect coins from these videos. It's a big step and would help me justify the effort that I do put into this channel, as my time is already divided by other competing interests and requirements for survival. In order to be eligible for monetization, I need 1,000 subscribers. I have that. And also have 4,000 watch hours within the last 12 months, which I'm only about halfway there. This is definitely because I literally only uploaded one video in 2019, which wasn't even a minute long. So my last 12 months of watch time are pretty much entirely composed of videos I've uploaded in the last 10 weeks and lazy purple fans who took a wrong turn down the YouTube search bar. If each of these talking videos gets 1,000 people to watch them, that's my 2,000 hours of watch time, right there. I'll help you out by making these videos, and you'll help me out by getting me to that next step. That's all I've got, folks. Thanks for being here, and let's keep in touch.